Thank you so much. So I appreciate everyone coming here. Anybody want a seat? Raise your hand if you have a seat next to you. I just want to make sure that people don't have to stand if they don't want to. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. My name is Shara DeGrippo, and I just heard you have to stay for the whole hour. So let's make it a fun hour and try to kind of make it a little interactive and have some fun. So what I work on is understanding threat actor behavior, understanding the people that are sending attacks via our networks and via social means into our customers at Proofpoint. So I wanted to understand where do these threat actors start? What do they think about? What are they looking at? How are they making their decisions? What are they choosing and why are they doing that? If we can understand their behavior and reverse engineer that psychology a little bit, it helps us understand who might be attacked next or what particular assets may be of interest to those threat actors. So the most important thing on this slide is the chicken. Just remember it. So who am I? My name is Shara Grippo. I work at Proofpoint currently, but I have been largely in information security vendors most of my career for about 16 years now. Prior to vendor land, I worked at NNSA DOE. So any of you that have heard of that, I was there um, in Las Vegas for a few years before going back into vendor world. Um, I, re I lead our research teams. So essentially we pull down pieces of malware, things like ransomware, viruses, remote access Trojans, banking Trojans, key loggers. We take them apart, we reverse engineer them, we communicate with their command and control systems, we understand how they work, and we deploy protections and intelligence out to our customers. It's pretty simple um, in terms of the process, but the actual work itself is pretty in-depth, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So I actually live in Atlanta, so I just drove down here, which is um, really great. I've never been to Augusta before. It's my first time. Um, and my favorite protocol is DNS. Who else has a favorite protocol of DNS? Does anyone have least favorite protocol of DNS? You're not getting a lot done if you hate DNS. Okay, there's a story there, I imagine. Um, who, what's your favorite protocol? HTTP. HTTP, great, can't browse web without it, perfect. Need them both, yeah. Um, anybody have their favorite protocol is RDP? Nobody likes RDP, right? SSH, that's, a, that's one we like, yeah, yeah. I know a couple people think SSH, sure. So my Twitter is shared underscore I am. Uh, it's full information security content plus hundreds of pictures of my dog. So if you're interested in that, check it out. So let's talk about where we have been in the past. I've been in information security for about 16 years and I've seen the industry grow from something that we did on the side to something that was our full-time job. One of the few places that really had great security dedication really early on was government and military, which is one of the reasons that I felt Starting there in my career was so great. What have we been doing? We harden systems. We put endpoint protections on, right? How many next gen endpoint artificial intelligence, machine learning, buzzword, crypto, blockchain things do we have on our endpoints? A lot. Um, we talk about patching. We have really great patch management programs. Um, does anyone know, don't shout it out because we want to keep that to ourselves, but does anyone know their patch window in their organization? So the amount of time that you expect from when a patch is released by your vendor to the time that it's deployed fleet-wide in your environment. Does anyone know their patch window? Don't know your patch windows? Some of you do, some of you don't. Okay, so the, the average patch window within the financial services industry is 145 days. Microsoft considers 30 days to be the maximum patch window. So that should give you an idea of how far behind we are with a lot of patching programs that need to be updated and fixed. Um, we think about perimeter defense, right? We've got firewalls, we've got network segmentation, we've got DMZs, we've got that whole concept of looking at those Visio diagrams, looking at network diagrams, understanding where our protections are, thinking about the perimeter. We do defense in depth, right? We layer our different technologies, we layer our different capabilities to make sure that if one fails, we've got something in backup to help us defend our, our network, our assets, and our people. So does anyone remember the hard, crunchy outside and soft, chewy center? So that's typically what's, what networks were referred to when I started, was we thought that those perimeter defenses were really strong, but the internal parts of the network were kind of a big mess. And I feel like that's still sort of the case. But this is kind of where we are now. We're getting going. And what have we reaped? What is the result of that? Critical vulnerabilities are down. I think that's true. If you look at 10 years ago, we were running this idea of like every day is zero day. 
there's a nightmare scenario around every corner with every vulnerability a decade ago. Now, a new vulnerability coming out, they're not as critical as they used to be. The browser vulnerabilities are way down. We don't see exploit kits like we used to because there's no vulnerabilities to exploit. Not as much as there were. Um, does anybody work with software developers in this room, in software engineers, developers, and you're telling them when you work with them that they need to build security into their applications from the beginning, right? That is owed to all of you a debt of gratitude because the people that are working in security with our developers are part of the reason that we've had success in reducing system vulnerabilities and reducing application vulnerabilities. So feel good, every time that you work with a developer and you give them a security mindset, you're helping to protect every single person who uses that application going forward. We've seen security become more important in organizations, people are focused on it, but are we really winning this? Are we really more secure? We have more certifications and more people dedicated to it than we ever have in the past. Is our security posture really better? Is our risk really lower? So to answer that question, let's talk about the landscape. And the first thing I like to talk about when I talk about landscape is where I get my landscape data from. If somebody wants to tell you what's happening out there before they tell you where their data came from, you should stop them. So we always want to understand where's that data coming from, and I'll tell you mine. So I process about five billion messages a day, not personally, in the system where we see everything in those emails. So all the attachments, all the URLs, and all the content body. We examine those emails and we look at everything about them. And those emails come from about 60% of the Fortune 100. We have about 6,400 enterprise customers. So a lot of these are large organizations, both commercial, NGO, government, any organization you could think of that processes mail could potentially be running through our systems. We see about 300,000 unique daily samples of malware a day. So we do deduplication based on a fuzzing capability around the hash, which means that if a piece of malware is similar, then we only count it as one. A bunch of them are really similar, we'll count that as one, and we do about 300,000 of those a day. We get about 500, 500 billion nodes in our threat graph. You can think of anything in a threat graph as like an atomic indicator. So an IP address, a fully qualified domain, anything like that, we would consider that a node in the threat graph. We look at network. Um, we have a worldwide deployment of IDS sensors that are at government, commercial, and non-governmental agencies that watch the traffic all around the world so that we can see what kind of traffic is being processed across the internet and how much malware is potentially in that traffic or communicating over it. So let's talk about messages. Um, we typically see two main ways to get malicious capability through email. You can attach it as an attachment or you can put a link in a body and ask someone to click it. That's the way to use email. We are seeing that right now, um, attachments are beating URLs and that's typical. Excuse me, URLs are beating attachments and that's typical. We see them go back and forth. Sometimes URLs will be more popular, sometimes attachments will be more popular. But the basis is the threat actors switch back and forth between both depending upon what is getting their payload through to their target more. It's pretty common A-B testing, making sure that what they're doing is going to work because if it's not going to work, then they're wasting time and money and we'll get into how much money it costs them in a minute. So this is the uniqueness level of malicious URLs that we see. And uniqueness is important because it makes it hard to block, right? If every single bad URL is different, how do we put in protections for that? It's hard. And one of the reasons that uniqueness has gone up, does anybody have a guess how to get unique URLs constantly, as many as you want forever? DGA, yes, and URL shorteners as well. So we can do GGA, which is domain generation capability, the algorithm that generates them and registers them, as well as leverage things like Bitly. Whoever said that over there, I have another question for you. Do you know what happened on March 31st of this year? Anyone know why March 31st is celebrated in the threat landscape industry? What? Day before, April Day. <laughs> Day before April Fool's Day? Close, no. Google actually shut down their URL shortener completely. GOO.GL, that service was taken offline completely because it was found to be abused in 99% of cases. It was only being used for malicious purposes, essentially, and so Google shut it down. When you're looking at other shorteners, keep that in mind. URL shorteners are essentially a direct route to malware most of the time. 
And that explains this uptick in, in uniqueness. They're using the combination of DGAs, URL shorteners, and the ability to really process through tons and tons and tons of URLs and send a unique URL to every single person. Now, if I'm doing a campaign of 100,000 messages, I can get 100,000 unique URLs, and most of the URL capabilities with shortening give you tracking and metrics, so I can see who clicked it, when they clicked it, what they did after they clicked it, and get lots of information back if I use a shortener as well. So let's talk about payload types. These are the types of payloads that we see coming through emails. Information stealers, credential stealers, remote access trojans, key loggers, occasional ransomware. We see cryptocurrency miners, point of sale malware, and we see a lot of credential fish. So anything interesting about this graph right here? Christmas, right. So that's the holidays. We see the drop there on Christmas Eve, and it goes through about the 7th. So what we know about our threat actors is they only want to work when people are at their desks that they're targeting. So if they send out a campaign, the longer it goes before that person clicks on that malicious payload, the higher the chances that they will not be successful. So if I send, let's make one up. If I send a remote access Trojan to Mary in accounting on December 24th, do you think she's going to be working really hard on her email that day? No. And in fact, that entire time period, people just aren't at their desks. There's no reason to send a threat campaign if people aren't at their desks because of all of the things that could happen. It could be detected in that time. It could be ripped out of their email box. They could not be paying attention and just hit delete because they don't want to deal with it because they're in holiday mode. All of these different things are a waste, so the threat actors typically have the same holiday seasons we do. We also see... Um, that this in, in this particular 2019 encompasses, or 2018 and 2019 encompasses Orthodox Christmas. Does anyone know why that is an issue for us? Why is that? Yes, so Eastern Europe is really the origin of a lot of the threat actor activity that we see, and we see them taking off the Orthodox holidays many times. That's a great question. So I'll just repeat for those who might not have heard. The question is, are we seeing different patterns around date and time for different verticals within industry? So banking, finance, media, manufacturing, hospitality, do they have a different profile? This is an aggregate profile. I would be interested in understand that, understanding that. We do see finance, I know specifically, getting that kind of banker's hours concept where they won't, there are some threat actors that won't send it all on Fridays because that is a day that a lot of bank, banking employees don't work at all. So we do see that sometimes vertically aligned, but that's something I'd like to check out. Um, I will give you a sticker prize for that good question. Oh. All right, now everybody's talking, right? So let's go through banking Trojan infection chain. This might be something that you're familiar with, but if you're not, it's an important basis for the rest of what we'll talk about. We see a malicious email. It has an attachment in this case instead of a URL. Oops. So what happens is the user downloads that attachment out of their email and they click to enable macros, which I'll go into detail in a moment. Once macros are enabled, they can download the framework of the malware itself. So in this case, it's the framework of a banking Trojan. Let's call it Ursniff. That's one of the big ones that we see a lot of. So they've downloaded the malware. It's on their machine, but it's not quite ready yet because what we need to do next is we need to communicate with the command and control capability so that that Banky Trojans framework can be filled in with the work that it needs to do. And the way that we do that is that we communicate with the command and control, giving it a profile of that host machine, which includes things like default language, what browser is default, what applications are installed, what's in the history of the browser, what is the IP address, what is the version of the operating system. It builds a bespoke little profile of that particular target machine and sends it back and forth to the command and control capability. When it then is finished, it downloads a configuration file that plugs in to that malware framework. Make sense? 
So once we've got that, we've got the malware, and it's got this customized capability configured within it that then when the user visits their bank login, they'll get something that we might refer to as browser, man in the browser, where they are visiting what they think is their bank. But when they put their username and password in, it's actually showing them something like, please wait, spinning. And in the background, it's contacting the actual banking website with their credentials and transferring that money out into the threat actor's bank account. Make sense? So we think we're visiting our bank, but in fact, it's just sort of a decoy of what our banking website really looks like. It's functional, it interacts with us. It might even show us our account information, but in the background, that command and control server is able to transfer funds because they've got their credentials. Something I like to point out about this is that yes, if that happened to me or to one of you, it would be frustrating. We have to go to our bank, we have to call, I've been a victim of fraud, et cetera, et cetera. But if this happens to large corporate and organizational banking accounts that have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, I don't keep millions of dollars in my checking account, not yet. Um, <laughs> But for large organizations that do, this is a much harder hit for them to deal with than it is for us when we have a couple of weeks of paychecks or something like that in our bank account. So what we found is that this is a traditional banking Trojan infection chain, but we found something in the past two years that's a little new that I consider like a fad or a trend right now, which is after the funds are transferred out, we see that the banking Trojans have modules now leaving cryptocurrency miners behind them. So they're getting you from every direction. They're taking your traditional currency out of your bank account, and then they're using your software and your hardware to mine cryptocurrency, which they then transfer to themselves as well. So they're getting every kind of currency capable. So let's talk about what the attackers see. This is what they're trying to do. What are they looking for? Does anyone kind of recognize this? It's, pretty, it's a pretty standard network diagram like we were talking about before, right? So we've got the internet and the cloud, and we've got our firewall, we've got web servers and our DMZ, pretty typical. We've got another second layer of firewall protections here, and that contains our more internal servers like file shares, email servers, all of your PCs are on this internal LAN network, and then the other side we have our employees. Pretty basic, everyone should have seen one of these before, probably, right? So this is the way that we look at our network. This is the way we understand our domain that we have to protect. Our, our home is our castle, and this is where we live, and all that. So this is the way we're thinking of it, but our attackers are just skipping all this. This is trash to them. They're just looking at these people. That's all they care about. That's all they want to know is this person, who they are, what they can do for me, and how I can get to them. That's really what they're focusing on. This middle part now, these systems have been hardened, right? We talked about it. We've been successful in hardening systems. Now the weak spot are these people. So what we found is that our attackers will actually go and do full reconnaissance on their potential victims. And what's great now is that they have the capability to do that reconnaissance at scale by leveraging technology. Does anyone know what, what this is a screenshot of? Does this look familiar? Yes, wow, okay, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Everyone knows LinkedIn. Does everyone know how many times the LinkedIn database has been breached? It's been breached twice, full breach. Maybe more than that, but I know of two big ones. Does anybody know how many times a Salesforce database has been breached? At least once, yes. So both Salesforce and LinkedIn have had their entire databases breached and made available on the web, not even the dark spooky web, the, dark, the, the regular web. You can just go get it, it's free, it doesn't cost any money. If you wanna just Google around, I wanna download LinkedIn breach database, you can just go get it right now. Um, and that contains a lot of really sensitive information. So what if I download that database or a partial piece of it that I'm interested in and I start iterating over it technically to find people that I think are my best victims or my best targets? Maybe I want only people that work in finance or maybe I want only people that work in HR at a finance company and have only been at the company for less than two years. I got that on LinkedIn, no problem. So what we do is we put together uh, information from an attack and we understand what kinds of roles those people had. So imagine that this gray bar on the side actually has people's names, which we have redacted out to protect their privacy. But we do know their particular job titles. 
And what we start to do is we start to put together a picture that is not intuitive to what you or I might think would make a great target. So you might think, well, my CEO or my commanding officer might be the best target. That's who they should really go after. Well, I don't know, because those people typically don't have the capability to just send money anywhere. The CFO does. The CFO's junior admin probably does. And so what it starts to show us is not who we think is the best target with our human brain meets, but who actually is being targeted by the threat actors, right? So this is actually showing what threats they're receiving, not who we think would receive them. And what I think is interesting about this is you start looking at these and they start ranking in a way that doesn't make a lot of sense to our regular understanding of hierarchy within a business. So this is a VP of strategy and investor relations getting a lot less threats than somebody who runs human resources. Interesting. Why might a human resources admin, there's no right answer. So why would a human resources admin or a human resources manager be so attractive? Access to more people, good. You can win a sticker also. Awesome, awesome. Anybody else? Control of payroll, perfect, I love it. Yes? Yes, you think that it was a CEO that wants the data, you could give it out. They have access to W-2s. You guys have seen W-2s stolen before. Yes? Say that again? You could potentially in-process a fictitious employee. If you guys could hand that to her, thank you. So there's lots of ideas. Yes, one more. They think they're providing customer support. Right, they think they're providing customer support. HR might have access to things that customers might want. HR actually has a lot of access to money. They can buy a lot of things without a lot of problems. Employee recognition, employee parties, things like that, gift cards. HR has ability to move money in a way that a lot of departments might not, especially maybe at this company that the threat actor has done some reconnaissance on. Those were great answers, awesome. So essentially what we're trying to do here is not think, okay, who's a big target, but actually say who's getting targeted and what are they receiving and why. So let's talk about social engineering and let's walk through another attack chain or the other side of the attack chain. So my name is Vincent Capucci. I'm a senior partner at this law firm. Your spouse has contracted me to prepare the divorce papers. Here's the first draft. Please contact me as soon as possible. So I, I used to ask when I would talk about this slide as an email, I used to ask who would click on this and everyone, no, no. Do you know someone who would click on this? <laughs> yes, yes, of course. So I've also heard people say, I wouldn't click on that, I'm not married. I mean, all the more reason to click on it so you can see someone else's divorce papers. <laughs> Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, could you, would you wanna see their divorce papers? Okay, maybe it's not Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, but it's somebody's. How much money do they have? Is there something going on with the kids? Was there an affair? Your users are gonna click on this. And the reason that I know that is because we track click data and we see what people click on. We also protect people from things they shouldn't click on. And I still track that. Yes? Yes, so that's a very savvy user, right? So he's saying essentially who could do a little um, investigation and find out that this is fake or that it might lead to malware. Some of you probably are trained to do that, which is awesome but a lot of your users might not be. So something that I love about this one is that it plays on that emotional side. And as soon as that person says, well, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not married. I don't, what? Oh, now I wanna know. It turns it from a shock and a concern into a curiosity. So they're taking on that social engineering trip that's always going to lead to clicking on this. It goes to a banking trojan. So this is also patterned completely off a real law firm that really exists in New York. This is their real logo, and these are sent out at scale. That's the thing I want everyone to understand is that technology has enabled the threat actors to do tons of mass sending out 
with the click of a button, it's super easy. And in fact, if they aren't really technical, they can buy time on infrastructure where they can just point and click their way to sending 100,000 messages like this to anyone they choose without a lot of technical background or skill. So we've got an email, it's got an attachment. Let's look at another one. Hello, so this is addressed to the actual person who received it and it says, I'm emailing you to submit my complaint about the horrible treatment that I received with my wife at your location store. So this is all correct. We believe that this actor is personalizing them based off of a LinkedIn database breach. And the email goes on to say, something terrible happened to me. If you don't respond and help me in the next three days, I'll have to escalate this situation. Please see the attached complaint letter. And it actually has a real name of the recipient. So there's a lot of reasons that somebody would open this. One, they think the complaint is about them. Two, maybe it's their responsibility to look at complaints, and so they open it up. They want to know what's going on. There's a lot of reasons that people would click on this, and I think that the social engineering at scale aspect can never be forgotten. They are able to do this to hundreds of thousands of people all at once, all with information that references exactly where they live, where they work, that has the full information, and it's accurate. So this is a third one. Hi, this is a chance to see. There, has anyone heard of um, Game of Thrones? It's like a little television show. <laughs> so this is talking about season seven, which was the season prior to the final season, which was season eight. Does anyone remember what happened at season seven? Not in the plot, but to the show. Yes? The HBO ah, yes. Very good, very good. Paul, will you pass him a taco? Thank you. So at the time the episode, uh, the season seven was coming out, HBO was breached. They made that public. They publicly disclosed that they were breached, and they publicly disclosed that somebody took unaired Game of Thrones episodes. Bold choice on HBO's part, but let's leverage that current event that people care about in our organization to get them to click. This, don't read it. If, there are spoilers. Don't read this if you're not caught up. So what they're saying is, I will show you these unaired episodes. I'll show you some little clips of them. You just pay me, and I'll give you the full episode. The preview clips are attached. Easy. None of us in here would click on this. But do we know someone who would? I feel like Game of Thrones was so huge at that time. We can never discount the power that something happening in media, like sports, current events, movies coming out, any of those kinds of things can potentially have on our users that they're like, I have to have this, I'm gonna click it. What, it's only 50 bucks? It's 50 bucks and I can have three unreleased Game of Thrones episodes? Yes, and they'll click it and they'll open it and now they have a keylogger on their machine. So these are the emails that we see. So what happens when you click on it and you download that file? You get things like this. This is fake, this is a malicious macro document it is leveraging the McAfee brand to help people have a false sense of security. This is very well done. It looks just like the McAfee protection capability. It's using their brand, it's using their logo. Looks nice. So another one that we see a lot is you open up that content, it's a Word document, and it wants you to click enable content. We see language matches to the targets. So if our threat actor knows that someone is in Germany that they're targeting, maybe they work at a German or a Swiss bank, they will send them a German lore, a German email, and a German macro. This particular macro says, the Office document that you are trying to view has been created with a newer version of Office. Please make sure to upgrade. And I think that that's an, another great one because we're always telling people, patch your systems, run your upgrades. There's a vulnerability. You want to be on the newest version. This is leveraging that capability. And then the, fa the final one, as an example, is leveraging a lot of stuff. So it's basically saying that in order to view this, you have to enable macros. And remember, enabling macros allows us to communicate with that command and control server from before where we can download the profile that will help the banking Trojan work. Um, a macro allows you to run VBScript in the background, so it essentially makes the, the machine much more configurable and actionable than it would be otherwise. So they're saying you need to click here to enable your RSA Secure ID token. Everyone knows the little um, hard tokens with the two-factor capability. So here it's trying to tell people, hey, in order to leverage your two-factor capability, you need to enable macros and then you'll download this malware. So as I was saying before, I do track clicks and I've seen people click on a malicious URL 
40 times. Even though we are blocking it in our systems, they keep clicking it, the same person. They will keep clicking it, and they will get a page that says, this is malicious, your company has blocked this, you're not allowed to see it, and they will keep clicking it. When I was um, at NNSA, we had what we call pink page, which was, this is not allowed, it was a pink background that said, you can't view this on your government system. It's a similar concept, but they'll leave this in their email box, and they will keep clicking it, and clicking it, and clicking it, even though they don't get it. And so I can see that data, and I've, the largest one I've ever seen was 40 clicks. Yes? Yes, of course. So you would want to forward this to your home account because you can't view it on your work machine, right? And in fact, if you forwarded it maybe to your Gmail, why not just open your Gmail right on your work machine there? That makes life easier, right? So, yeah. Yes, we do. So it's all within the actual SMTP gateway. Um, and we also have browser isolation, but this is not a product discussion. So we have, we have account managers in the back who can tell you about all the products. I, I talk about all the horrible things we're seeing, and then we can talk about the products separate. <laughs> um, I like to take the nightmare journey as deep as I can before. Um, and so all of the threats that I'm showing here are things that we've blocked, and that's why we have them, is because we can essentially um, see them in the mailstream being stopped. So let's walk through some case studies. So this particular campaign um, was a threat actor reaching into some customer service aliases. I'm sure we all deal with aliases all the time. So contact, abuse, um, IT help, help desk, ticketing, things like that that are big group email boxes. What's great about a group email box? It gets to like a lot of people at once, right? You might be sending to something that's just help at the domain and it might go to a, a call center full of 50 people, 100 people, but that's all they do all day is answer those emails. So we saw this particular campaign. This is not the same campaign that caused this, um, the Marriott hack, but for those of you that remember, this was a brand that was compromised from 2014 to 2018. They didn't know that they were compromised. And they have a lot of aliases, such as reservation aliases. Hospitality is a huge target, not only for commodity threat actors, but in my experience, hospitality is the number two vertical targeted by APT, which is our nation state threat. Does everyone know what APT is? Yeah, okay, so this is one of my favorite things to do. Everyone say it all at the same time. You ready? One, two, three. Advanced persistent threat. Great, that's fun. Yes, you can get a sticker. So, <laughs> oh, you have two. So, what we know here is that hospitality has a lot of information about humans. They have passport numbers, oh. but they also have things that are preferential, like I like to be on a high floor, or what I ordered from room service, or I'm allergic to feathers, I only want synthetic pillows. All of these preferences were accessed in this breach, and that creates an incredible treasure trove of knowledge to social engineer with. What if somebody really important in your organization, I knew everything about their hotel stays? That's a lot of information. And hotels are famous for having these aliases as well. So let's talk about the actual campaign that we saw. This was a rat, which is a remote access Trojan, meaning they get on the machine and they have backdoor access to be able to see whatever's happening on that particular machine. It was in the end of last year. It was a total of 68 messages 54 of those messages went to companies that are in the hospitality vertical. So you can tell that aside from a little piece of it, they did a really good job targeting with this campaign. It only went to aliases that handle reservations. So it was specifically focused on reservations agents aliases at hospitality companies, and it gives remote access. So let's look at it. So these are some of the um, types of addresses that it was sent to. It's a Word document with an embedded file that you click to enable macros. It downloads a rat. But this is the actual macro document. And what I love about this is that, can you guys read this? No, right. Even if you're looking at it on a computer, not on a screen projection, you can't read it at all, which I think is a good little social engineer of this person's going to click because they want it to fix, they want it to work, they want to be able to read it, they want to do their job. 
So it's an extra little push of, you can't see this, you better click to enable it. So let's talk about another one. Let's talk about the movies. Who likes to go to the movies? I like to go to the movies. I'm a big movie person. I just saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's fantastic. So this is one that we saw targeting individuals and it only went to two organizations, two companies, and they were both theater providers. For those of us that, you know, in my town, I think we have like three theater chains and that's it. This was two big chains of theaters that this was sent to. It was nine messages, two theaters, and it was in a PDF that leads to a landing page that looks like this staffing page. This is completely spoofed and it looks exactly like the real USA Staffing Services homepage that you go to. It pops up a little thing telling you to download a zip file. You execute that and it gets what's called the Morex Downloader, which basically is a backdoor capability that can then download other things, it's modular, onto that particular host. So what we have here is a threat that takes you to this page, tells you to download some malware, you click yes, now you've got a backdoor on your machine, a download on your machine, and this is who it went to. I've removed the last names, but Raymond, he received operationsmanager.pdf. Jordan received taxsupervisor.pdf. Jorge, restauranttheatermanager.pdf. These were the names of the attachments of those files that they needed to open and click. Well, I looked up each of these people on LinkedIn, because we love to stalk our, our recipients, and Raymond, his title on LinkedIn is operations manager at where he actually works. He's been there for 10 months. It tells us his location, everything that I need to know to target him if I wanna get him to click on this staffing. He receives something that is his exact job title as the attachment going to a staffing company that makes it look like it's a potential job offer. Another one is Jordan. Her title on LinkedIn is tax supervisor. She received taxsupervisor.pdf. And then Jorge, restaurant theater manager, his LinkedIn, this is a screenshot directly off his LinkedIn, he's a restaurant theater manager. So the other thing that I'm starting to do now, I don't have complete data on this yet, but I'm starting to track around how long people have been in their roles so I can see that their threat profile and how it changes over time in their role. So is someone who's been there four years a bigger target than somebody who's been there four months? Don't know. I don't know the answer to that. You would say yes. Right, right, and they're looking for the next step. So maybe that, that means that people have been in their role longer or more susceptible to job change threats. Yeah, so I don't have that data completely ready yet, but I am working on that, I find it really interesting. So here again, we have the name of the attachment mapped perfectly to the name of their title on LinkedIn, telling them to open it up for a new job. So let's talk personal assistants. Does anybody work with personal assistants or they have them in their organization. So we have admin assistants in my organization. They're huge targets pretty much everywhere. In this particular case, it was the end of last year, she received an email where she clicked the link and it brought up a fake SSL VPN login page. Does anyone know what's interesting about this SSL VPN login page that's new, neat? Yes, exactly. It has the capability of putting in the two factor. So they're really mimicking that particular VPN portal to get the RSA token and transmit that back as well, which can then automatically log into the real one. So it asks for her username, her password, and her hard token. So I checked her out. Um, she is an employee. She is the only person in our entire customer base, 34 or 6,400 enterprise customers, all of those millions of employees, she's the only person that received this threat. It came from IT support at companyname.co. As you can see, she's in the United Kingdom. And what does the UK usually have for their TLD? .co.uk, exactly, exactly. So she got it from .co. Her company owns .co.uk and .com. So it's very easy to just look and say, oh, it's from IT support, no problem. The from on the message was network administrator, and she's the only one that received it. And she had been there for six months when she received this threat, which I think is an indicator of what we were kind of talking about before is, are people that have been there fresh, they're brand new in the role, are they more of a target? I think in this case, an administrative assistant who's been in the role a very short time is a great target to get their credentials. One quick question is, do you see any other uh, attacks from NFA such as RSA, Google, Center, Off Control, EDD? Because it was interesting that they targeted specifically RSA. 
That's a good question. So he's asking, are we seeing um, targeting of other RSA or targeting of other two-factor capabilities like YubiKey, Google multi multi-factor authentication? So we do see that occasionally, but I think that RSA's hard token dominated the market for so long that they're just making a smart guess that the user is probably using it. We've also seen more ham-fisted attempts where it'll say YubiKey, Google, it'll have all of them and hope the person just smashes the keys until something gets in there. Has anyone heard of Silent Librarian? No, okay, so Silent Librarian is an APT actor. Silent Librarian is state-sponsored out of Iran. This is the most active state actor I'm getting. It's a lot of work right now. Um, we usually see our state-sponsored actors being very careful. This particular actor, part of the reason I'm talking about it publicly is because they just, they just bang them out all day long. They're not careful. They don't mind if they get caught. They work really hard. They've been indicted by the United States government as well as the Canadian Mounties in a joint indictment. Um, and this is something new. We have not normally seen the government do indictments. This has started in the past two years where they're starting to indict actual espionage um, actors for cyber crime. Um, there's a really low likelihood that we would ever be able to catch these people, but the indictment is out there, and these are government employees of Iran who are charged with doing um, cyber threat activity. They are, they are targeting universities and higher education. Does anyone want to give, let me just get stickers ready. Does anybody want to give a guess about why universities and higher education are attractive? Yes. They do research and development. They do research and development. That's right. Any other guesses on to why? Yes. They have tons of dollars in endowments. They have dollars in endowments. That's right. They have tons of endowments. Very good. Ding, 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 ding. Yes. So a lot of what we find is that often those employed at higher education, they're doing research and development. Higher education has access to large billions of dollars of endowments. They are doing things often as um, foreign nationals. So we see that a lot of um, employees at government, or excuse me, at higher education may have been government employees in the past. They may be working on something that leads directly to a government contract of some kind. Higher education employs a lot of very, very high value individuals when it comes to APT. So this particular campaign, they're called Silent Librarian because it's always about the libraries. They'll say things like, your library account is expiring, um, you need to renew your access. I've seen recently that they're starting to do overdue book notices. Of course, these are all fake, but when you send these to those in the academic community, they're concerned. The social engineering lore works in that case because they want to take care of their account. So the way that this threat works is that they get a fish, and sometimes it'll go direct, but other times it'll bounce through multiple universities. We see them mimic the pages of the actual libraries. And something that I find really interesting about this one is that when the user puts in their username and credentials, the uh, fake landing page steals them, but it also nicely redirects them logged in to the actual library site that they want to use, which is polite. So the way that they're doing this, they're making these cloned landing pages and they're compromising university accounts one by one by one. They're using URL shorteners provided by a different university and then they're creating customized pages to a third university. So they're preying on this idea that higher education employees will click, 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 click through to anything that looks like it's academic and put their credentials in, as well as once they've got the credentials, they compromise that account, account and they use that to send back out over and over again. Make sense? So we do see some APT activity. We're going to do the pass all the way back. Will you pass that all the way back to the back corner? So we do see APT activity a lot of times at um, K through 12 education, state and local government, municipal government. And the reason for that is a lot of those um, state and local and K through 12, they have direct access to federal systems a lot of times, either for federal grants or um, information sharing, things like that, they have direct access a lot of times into those systems. Yes? The uh, students also have immature credit records, therefore they can be likely targets because they don't often check their own credit reports. 
Yes, that could be true too. So a lot of times students don't have a lot of credit history built up and they obviously need money. Um, so we see them fished quite a bit too. A lot of the silent librarian is targeting um, employees, professors, and things like that. So the thing that really stands out for me about silent librarian is that they have no shame in terms of their volumes. So the largest campaign that we saw was 102 messages. That was earlier this year. 192 messages for an APT campaign is massive. That's crazy. Most APT campaigns that we see from China, Russia, North Korea, five messages, two messages, one per year, not from that particular um, uh, nation state, but per campaign. So they'll target one or two people. Silent Librarian targets almost 200 people at a time. They're really just not trying to hide, and I have a feeling that's because there really just aren't a lot of repercussions that can happen if they're caught. So let's talk about one more APT campaign. This was from July 19th to 26th, so very recent. We published a full blog on this if you want to go read it. We have the complete reverse engineering information on it. It's a malware called Look Back. It was sent to three organizations. It was highly sophisticated, and it only went to electrical, municipal electrical utilities. So those are people that are your power company. That's who you, you know, send you your power bill every month. It's been really hot lately, so mine's been really high, but they've been targeting electrical utilities, only three of them, and it gives the attacker remote access. The lore was this. NCEES, Advancing Licensure for Engineers and Surveyors, you failed your exam. Does anyone in here have a certification that helps them in their job role? Is anyone in here getting CPEs for that certification right now? So this is the same thing, but it's for engineers who work on things like power companies, hydroelectric dams, et cetera. Imagine if you got this from ISC squared and it said you failed your CISSP. Same thing. What if your CISSP is a requirement to do your job? All of a sudden, you're out of compliance with being able to hold your job. It's scary. It's concerning. It's an emotional social engineering lore. Let's click it. So what this does is it essentially downloads an MS Word document attachment, which enables uh, Visual Basic macros. It installs the look back malware and it pretends to be from this certifying organization, which is NCEES, and they registered NCEESS.com. So they created full infrastructure to be able to send from a very close look alike domain and create this fake lore, allowing them to trick people into thinking that they want to click on that. So, does anyone remember from the first slide? We've reached time for chicken. So this is my understanding of what it looks like to work in a Eastern European threat actor office every day. We know that this is a job for them. It's not considered sketchy. It's not even really considered crime. As long as they send their payloads out to the West, it's really not of concern to most people that work in these jobs. It's considered legitimate. They're going to work on their computer every day. So we started seeing attacks going against fast food restaurants in the middle and um, end of last year. But in the summer, they were hitting fast food restaurants really hard. Anything with a value meal, a Coke, fries, and a burger, they were just slamming them, slamming them, slamming them. Does anyone want to take a guess <laughs> as to why a fast food restaurant might be a good target. Free Wi-Fi. Free Wi-Fi, okay. Anything else? They could get on the free Wi-Fi. So any other ones? Yes. So we see really, really high volumes of transactions for fast food restaurants. They're small transactions, they're all day long, and there's hundreds or thousands of them. And the other thing that we found is that they were correlating their attack to be against establishments that had broken chip readers. Have you seen this? Where they put it, okay, good. Sometimes I go ask about this, and he's like, no, I've never seen it. I see this all the time. No chip, don't use your chip. Swipe, no chip, swipe, no chip, right? So if we're doing that, that means that we're not authenticating the credit cards in the same way, and we're storing those um, point of sale credit card information on the actual point of sale. So essentially, you would say that uh, shout out that uh, well, I don't know how many would end up in it, but they targeted or shout out at least three. One of them was, you know, uh, Texas Tech. So there's a device that you can put on what looks like your phone. You can scan within 10 feet of someone. When they swipe their card, there's an electronic signal that happens in this device. They're close enough. 
Yeah, they can do skimmers too. So they could stand and get it wirelessly or they could do a skimmer. And in this particular case, with the chip reader broken, all the threat actor has to do is get on that point of sale machine and they've got it all. So after we saw them hitting hamburger places, they started hitting one in particular. And that, that particular place has 99 cent deals Monday through Friday. And I was talking to one of my researchers and I said, okay, what's happening with the fast food guys? What are the fast food guys doing? He says, Wednesday. I'm like, okay. He's like, it's Wednesday today, so it's really going crazy. I'm like, why is Wednesday crazy? Wednesday was their 99 cent hot dog day. And what that taught me was that my researchers on my team are digging in so deeply into these fast food organizations that they know the specials, they know the menus. They were telling me franchise owners' homes where franchise owners lived because we were desperate to figure out why this threat actor was banging on these fast food restaurants so hard that we started doing reconnaissance on them as well. If we are able to do that reconnaissance on these fast food restaurants, the guys in Eastern Europe, it's their job, they're doing it all day, that's what they're paid to do. So they're hitting the hot dog place, 99 cents, every day, over and over and over and over again. Then they pivot. They stop hitting every fast food and they start hitting fast food that's famous for chicken. And I'm from Atlanta, and there's actually more fast food chicken restaurants than you might realize. There's a lot of them that focus on chicken. And this was every place that did a bucket of chicken, a chicken sandwich. I just saw recently, did you guys see on Eater, they had like a battle of the best fast food chicken sandwiches? Do you see that? Um, Shake Shack won. But they were talking about anything that's based on chicken, focused on chicken, and that's all they were hitting. And we were going nuts. It was five weeks. Chicken, 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 chicken. If you had chicken in the name, if you were famous for your chicken, that's all they cared about. Burgers had dropped off, hot dogs were gone. It was all about hitting these chicken restaurants. So what, what is this? They pivot away from chicken sandwich restaurants into poultry farms. Again, I live in Atlanta. A little bit north of me is a town called Gainesville, Georgia. Gainesville, Georgia is the poultry capital of the world. I was like, wow, my job is really coinciding with my real life. So they started hitting three poultry farms, two in the south, one in the northeast. They were destroying these poultry farms. We talked to some of the chicken restaurants. We said, do you know these poultry farms? Every single one of them said, yes, that's where we buy our poultry from. That's our poultry vendor. Okay, that's weird too. So we continue to watch this, and we're starting to pick up relationships between these vendors, the fast food restaurants, the credit cards, they all kind of use each other and know each other. Then they started hitting a VAR. They started hitting two VARs. Does anybody know what a VAR is? It's your value-added reseller. It's where you buy hardware, software licensing, a little bit of services, kind of your one-stop shop if you want to buy some stuff for your computers um, in, a, in an enterprise environment. So they started hitting this VAR, and there was two of them. And one of those VARs was very famous for its remote desktop software. So as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, okay, you started hitting fast food restaurants, then you started hitting only fast food chicken restaurants. Then you started hitting the chicken farms that sell to the chicken sandwich restaurants. Then you started hitting the VAR that sells their equipment to the poultry farms. The poultry farms are buying all of their licensing for their software from the chicken restaurant, or from the poultry, or excuse me, the poultry farms are buying from the bars. So what we have here is a supply chain attack that we had no idea about was happening because we were really trying to understand the fast food angle. But as we were learning the fast food angle, the threat actor was learning the vendor relationship angle. Because if I can get in between any of these transactions, I can either get a really big payday or why would I not just drop directly onto those bars that are sending those one use out, two use out? I could be inside that software instantly and control everything from there instead of having to wait on the payment drop. So they're evolving as we're evolving. So I have one more last one, and this is not a threat to a chicken and their associates, but this is a threat to the people in this room. So this is a lore that says, dear colleagues, please find attached the OSINT dashboard for week 27. Who works with OSINT? in here. The following link lets you access the documents directly via EBF SharePoint, and it tells you the file name, week 27 PDF, and it says that it comes from the European Banking Federation. Um, 
please consider the environment before printing this email. Don't print the malware, it's bad for the trees. So this was sent only to people in information security roles in organizations that um, we have as their, we have their data. So every single person that received this had the word security in their title. It was sent to about 50 people across the customer base. So they're targeting you guys in this room. Like why not have access to a firewall administrator's account or a security manager or security director's account? It's great access and they're privileged and I know how to get it, so why not? And that's my show. Any questions? We have four minutes. Everyone asked me that question. So Proofpoint sells products to prevent it. That's what we're in the business of doing. All my data is from customers that we've prevented, per, that we've prevented these things from happening to them. Sorry, I don't talk about that in the presentation, but yeah, so the, the data all comes from customers that we've protected using our technology. Yes. The way to find that out is to look at the data and understand exactly what they're receiving in their boxes. What are they being targeted with? Who are the actors that are targeting them? And having that data turned into intelligence, that's really the only way to know. And if you have any questions with regards to how Proofpoint can help come in, analyze your threat vectors, or better understand who your targets are within your organization, please just, at the end of the presentation, uh, let our friends from Walker & Associates scan you. We'll reach out to you. We'll directly contact you. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to come on site, show you a demonstration of how we can identify your threats within your organization. Yeah, one more. It, it looks like a lot of these clips came back for 54 and 5 click attack. What was the most clips that you've ever seen in a 50 attack? I've seen six so far. It's one of your great. That's a great question. How many clicks have we seen in a phishing attack? Um, I think five or six would probably be the most I've seen, which it'll lead from a shortener to a landing page to a shortener to a download to a PDF that has a link inside the PDF that you need to click that's password protected. So we do see that, and those chains are going to get more and more and more. I didn't address it very much in, in this talk, but a lot of that is because they're trying to evade detection by security vendors like us. Oh, BGP is your favorite. Very good. We need that. And that's essentially what a lot of what my team works on is that we get out bare metal to be able to download the payloads and have uh, get away from the geofenced payload defeat. So, like, we can come from France or Australia or Germany or whatever it takes to be able to commun communicate with the command and control and get the final payload at the end. That's not something you can do easily at scale. It takes individuals working as threat researchers to do it a lot of times. Thank you so much for coming and staying in the hot room.